So welcome to episode 129 of the Campus Comics cast. We are referring to this episode of, as the Love and Thunder, and all of that is from Mike Atchison because he is all about Love and Thunder. But I am joined <laughs> on this episode by... Mike Atchison. And Chad Schubert. And there, Atchison almost forgot to bring the Love and Thunder in his intro. <laughs> but uh, we got a lot to cover in this episode. We're going to do a brief rundown of the Thor uh, Love and Thunder trailer. Uh, we're of course going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, time talking about Neil Adams, and then we're going to uh, go into the Batman, our movie review, and then of course if we haven't ran too long talking. We're going to do a CLZ shake uh, for you. So uh, we did discuss uh, that we wanted to just give our initial thoughts of the Love and Thunder trailer, and uh, mine's probably going to be the most negative, so I'll go second. So who wants to go? Who wants to go first on the Love and Thunder trailer? So I'll let Shad talk, go. Right? Okay. All right. So Shad's going to get you, you've been nominated, Shad, to go first All right. on the. I'll take trailer. a swing at it. <laughs> All right. Um, and, you know, first, first, uh, first kind of instinct on this is that it's a, a look at all the people that are in this movie kind of trailer. It's just, uh, you know, we, we're going to have Guardians, we're going to have Thor, we're going to have, you know, Thor's pirate girlfriend for a second, and we're going to have Korg's going to be in there. And it, it just feels like it's just an introdu- introduction of, all of the the players in the game uh, is really all it is. No real story established. Uh, I don't know if we really need a story established in a trailer for a Thor movie after the fourth one. We kind of get what it's going to be uh, in in some way. So uh, so that makes sense to me. Uh, we get a, a glimpse of Jane Foster, obviously. Um, I I hope that that's not like just at you know the two hour mark. You know I I feel <laughs> like most of what we see in the with is a, a lot of interaction with the guardians uh and and his kind of departure from them so i'm imagining we're getting a pretty good glimpse of maybe the first 10 15 minutes of the movie is going to be this this uh kind of play out of how he loses weight and him saying goodbye to the guardians you know and yeah i feel like hopefully that's not most of the movie uh <laughs> and we we get a little bit more to it and and obviously more more jane to it because otherwise it'll feel a little bit like Guardians 2.5, um, and and though that would be fun, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think we necessarily need that. Uh, do we see Zeus in there? Is that who yes. that is? Okay. Yeah, Russell Crowe is supposed to be playing Zeus. So. Okay, gotcha. And then uh, I thought that Sweet Child of Mine was a good start to uh, a promis- uh, probably a promising soundtrack because uh, <laughs> soundtracks are seem to be good in in that realm of uh, the guardians of the galaxies and the new thors all play into the music pretty well so that's my my, my hot take i'll take all right so this was the first marvel trailer that i literally i shouldn't say literally i threw up in my mouth uh, <laughs> watching this trailer i hate this trailer so much this is everything that is wrong with the marvel cinematic universe i do not need a thor rocky training montage i do not need you know the teary-eyed thor i do not need thor looking into the eyes of star lord talking when star lord's talking about the one that they love we don't need two star lords uh you know when chris hemsworth was complaining that the role was too serious they should have said bye-bye um and and let him go the only thing redeeming about this entire trailer is the last seven seconds where we see Jane Foster Thor with a apparently rebuilt Mjolnir because you look and you see the cracks in the hammer. So the the hammer is back and now it is in Jane Foster's hand. And my big fear is that it's going to be some multiverse thing that's going to last about 30 seconds. And that's all the Jane Foster that we're going to get. But um, yeah, that's the only hope that I have in this movie is that Natalie Portman and one of the things about Natalie Portman, she's a great actress when she has a great director. And I don't think we have a great director for this movie either. So um, I'm extremely uh, negative. I am extremely negative going into this movie come July. So Mike, bring us up. <laughs> And you're muted, so you can't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't bring us up. No, I was I was taking a little extra time. There's so <laughs> many pause buttons and in. there's so many buttons and stuff on these gadget computers. <laughs> <sighs> I 
I'd like to think I agree with Scott a lot, but probably reality and history has proven otherwise. But in this case, I am so much more in agreement with him. Uh, and especially the scene with that gazing into each other's eyes. Uh, I thought you guys just are destroying the nobility of a character such as Thor. And that's what I've always liked about Thor. It's kind of like Aquaman. Aquaman's not supposed to be uh, hokey jokey. Not even the super friends Aquaman <laughs> that way. So that's what they're reducing uh, Thor to in this movie. Now, I'm all for the spacefaring. Uh, I mean, it's 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 not like these are truly capital G gods. They're aliens, right, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, they're more or less like the, the new gods of on the DC side. They're really just a super advanced alien race. And it, they, but they they were designed with an air of nobility and, and, and poise and whatever, but, and they, they really are kind of reversing course because that's what the way they were uh, portrayed in earlier movies uh, until Ragnarok, I guess. Um, But I I almost said, you know, guns and roses, sweet child of mine was the best part of the trailer. Really? (laughs) Um, It's, but it's um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, now I know at least what we're in for, I guess. I'll watch it, of course, but yeah. it's it's a little bit disappointing um, when they kind of make him um, such a comedic character. I've said this every single time we talk about Thor in the Marvel Cinematic. He's supposed to be a braggart, not a buffoon, and they keep making him a buffoon and more and more buffoony each one. So yeah. I'm ready for Thor's redemption. I don't think it's going to happen in this movie. So <laughs> no, I think that if they were going to, you know, if they were going to keep with that Thor that we saw in the first two movies, we probably wouldn't have gotten a third. Like we probably would just be done with Thor. Cause I don't think anybody wanted to buy that Thor anymore. Right. Uh, and I, at this point, I would be perfectly fine with that. With, with no more Thor. Sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that he could have ended his contract on Endgame. He could have died in Endgame with, with Iron Man and had his story finished. And I think I'd be happier right there. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's all in the eye of the beholder, I guess. But <laughs> anybody that's read, you know, classic Thor, it's it's. I think you you said it. He's it's he's supposed to be a braggart, not a buffoon. And um, but I don't know. Yeah, I just it's like this is peanut butter and chocolate, and they're not really mixed and well together <laughs> so i'm hearing i'm hearing you know, two thumbs down and one qualified thumb up or are you going I'll, thumb I'll, up? I'll thumb it up okay i'll, all right. I'll thumb it up <laughs> okay, i, I like two down, one up all right <laughs> i can't i personally i can't read thor is so boring in the comics like i i can't get through it i, I can't get through okay. it I'd rather read shakespeare to, okay so you need to read the j michael straczynski run of thor Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Then you also need to read the early uh, uh, Jason Aaron run on Thor, where we get Jane Foster. Okay. All right. And uh, what else? Dan Slott. His his the most recent one started off the one with. uh, You mean Donny Cates? I mean Donny Cates. The one where his alter ego, Doctor Blake, um, Mm -hmm. was the main. I haven't I, I haven't read that yet. So, yeah, that, that's that's really pretty good. Um, and I've only read maybe the first 10 issues, so. Yeah, I've the made JMS, no. JMS run on Thor and the early Jason Aaron run on Thor. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's enough about Thor. We weren't supposed to spend a whole lot of time <laughs> talking about the trailer. So, uh, all right, so let's move on to Neil Adams. And I think, uh, Mike, we should just probably just hand this over to you uh, to lead <laughs> us in this discussion about Neil Adams. So. Well, uh, let me pull up my handy dandy notes and and talk about Neil Adams. Uh, my, I, I just this is completely off the cuff. I haven't prepared notes, so it's completely um, just me talking about him. This is the first Neil Adams was the the first artist, and it's probably been said by many people, many comics fans that, especially around my age, that he was the first artist I could absolutely recognize and not just for his uh, signature autograph on the, on the cover or whatever, <laughs> but I mean, his style, um, the dynamism, the, uh, the, he could portray or, or 
or the anguish that he would um, make the character on the page be going through, whether it be, you know, Superman who uh, was, you know, being poisoned by kryptonite and he was going to take down the person that did it or he's bursting out uh, through the chains um, or Batman who's anguishing over Robin's, you know, seeming uh death uh it's his his emotion that he the that, that has already evoked um really it just jumped out of me i mean we're talking mid 70s when i really started reading comics the most and by the late 70s i was in my golden age my personal golden age of comics reading and um yeah so it's it's just one of those just one of those things that uh are, are one of those artists that are you know, once in a lifetime, maybe twice in a lifetime. And uh, I know I, I could probably speak of the he's he's in my top five artists of all time, probably number two. And I'm sure we'll be talking <laughs> next episode about my number one. Um, so. Do you want I mean, that was just my general background. Yeah, on. Do you want to just go? Do you want you guys want to give your background and then we go into our favorite stories or favorite covers? Um, why don't we just go ahead? Why don't you just go ahead and go into your choice story, and then we can kind of just let that other stuff information come out as as needed. So, what was your story, your art that okay. you wanted to talk about? Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I wish I would have shared this with you guys uh, earlier on, so you could maybe even pull up the image. But the there was uh, at least three issues, plus a fourth that really didn't have interior art by Neil Adams, but it was the origin of Ra's al Ghul or Ra's al Ghul, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, in Batman 232, and then it jumped to 242, 243, and 244. And this also, this run, uh, or this overarching arc, uh, featured the introduction of Ra's al Ghul. That's how I always pronounced it until somebody told me Denny O'Neill was Ra's, but Ra's still sounds weird. Uh, and the first appearance of the Lazarus Pit, and probably some other things. But what was what really comes to mind when we just, we talked about what uh, story we'd like to talk about? It, it this one jumped out of me right away, and uh, it it was all collected in limited collector's edition, the the tabloid treasury editions um, from the 70s, number C51. And I don't know if you've I'm sure you've seen it, Scott, uh, and I don't know if you have Shad, but it's it features kind of like uh, um, uh, it's got Batman kneeling over what looks like the body of Robin and Talia al Ghul, Roz's daughter in the background. Uh, Batman thinks Robin's dead and he's just, you know, torn up about it. And then in the background, which is sort of like almost it's just in the it's a whole different art or type of of art style but it's it's got Ra's al Ghul in the most menacing look with those you know almost um Fu Manchu like claw fingernails um so C51 is really what I it's, it collects that whole story it was written by Denny O'Neill and the penciler of the entire uh run was Neil Adams except for that issue 232 or 242 was the interior was um drawn by Irv Novick um and it's it just stands out to me when I think of stories, and there are many to choose from, even though he's more known for his covers. It stands out to me as the uh, uh, standout Neil Adams story that featured his art throughout. All right. Did anything else you wanted to say story-wise or cover-wise? or uh, Cover? Okay, sorry, I'm waiting for cues unnecessarily, aren't I? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the favorite cover I have is, and this one it was uh, even harder to to, to choose. Um, let me pull it up here. It's Flash 246, and I I picked it because I I was worried that one of you guys would pick something else that I would pick. Um, it's it had it features. Uh, Flash standing over the villain Abracadabra, 
and he thinks he's he got abracadabra laying on the ground apparently dead and flash is stunned he's like he he made me do it and got the police from the I believe Abracadabra's from the 64th century. Uh, the police are telling him you're under arrest, flash for murder. And just seeing, you know, you know I, I wasn't used to seeing Flash portrayed that way. You've seen a lot of Batman and Superman and and uh, some other characters like Dead Man uh, drawn by uh, Neil Adams. But this cover here, I remember just gazing over it for for a long, long time thinking, I, I just don't know how this guy does it, but uh, so Flash 240, 246. Uh, the actual story was written by Kerry Bates and uh, drawn by Irv Novick again, um, and it was one of the few Flash covers, if maybe maybe the only Flash cover that Neil Adams drew. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't it, I don't equate Neil Adams and Flash covers. That is for sure. No, so. no, and that's definitely. I mean, that's why I picked. Um, Pick that cover. There was some other ones I could have picked. Well, if but... if you weren't worried about us picking your cover, what would your cover have been? Um, it would have been one? that. It would have been um. Oh man, it was a Superman cover where he is one no where Metallo. Sorry. Oh okay. Not the not the Kryptonite no more. Okay. All right. No, that 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 one I I, I that would have been a close second or third, but uh, the one I would have picked is oh boy i forget the actual issue but it features superman kind of hunched over clenching his fist really mad and got this green tint to him and he's telling the villain that poisoned him which you don't know by looking at the cover who it is but it it, it is metallo he says i may be dying from from the kryptonite but i'm going to take you down with me and the menace that's that is that is given out by that image is one that just it just knocks your socks off. Um, so while you guys are looking up, you know, or talking about your picks, I'll I'll find out that that issue number because I had it at is it some three seventeen. That sounds right. Yeah. See, I'm See. I'm pulling up. Oh, okay. That that link was dead. So thank you, dead link on the internet. Oh man. Um, <laughs> And all all the ones I keep finding are like teeny tiny pictures, so they're not uh, they're not particularly helpful. But uh, yeah, that's it. It's three seventeen. Three seventeen. Okay. Yeah, the killer with the heart of steel, and yeah, it's Metallo's the villain. Uh, villain, but yeah, it, it's it, it's that that one. I mean, there are several more, but that one by itself. Um, is it, it would have been my pick, but I, I was trying to avoid those, those Superman or Batman covers. <laughs> All right, Chad, what about you? All right. Well, my uh, my knowledge of Neil Adams is a little uh, smaller uh, <laughs> and uh, my history with him. But uh, I, I knew the name growing up. I knew, you know, the team, the the Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill kind of team was was always a, a couple of names I heard together. And uh, probably didn't really pay attention to it too much until a few years back when uh, Kevin Smith had uh, had Neil Adams on a Fat Man on Batman episode, multiple Fat Man on Batman episodes. They went to like a what ended up being almost a six hour interview. And that's when I kind of really got to know uh, who Neil Adams was and not just the the cover that I've seen over and over again. So uh, when when he passed, uh, they did repost uh, the, that entire six hour long interview as I think episode looks, uh, 365 of the fat man beyond podcast now. So if you're interested in that, then check that out. Um, but I, when I think of, of Neil Adams covers, I, I think of two specifically that are fairly mainstream as the Superman versus Muhammad Ali, uh, rap cover. I always thought that was just neat. Uh, one to have like, Superman and then a real person against each other was just a, a cool concept. And then just finding all the people in the cover and, and, and the entire wraparound of it was, was always cool. And then of course the, uh, the green lantern 85 of, uh, my ward speedy is a junkie, uh, <laughs> you know, cover those, both of those always stood out to me just cause they were, they were kind of iconic and, and, uh, talked about. So ones that I, I paid attention to, but, 
a funny cover that I didn't know that I owned because I went on my CLZ and I was like, OK, do I own any Neil Adams in my collection? And uh, this will tell you a lot more insight into my collection is that he did the cover for Captain Planet issue one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i own that i totally so the, forgot that <laughs> so he didn't do the interiors or anything but he, he did the cover on that and uh and i was like oh okay well i guess i have uh, a couple of 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 things that are neil adams in my collection i've got the batman odyssey story that he did a few years back uh that wasn't awesome but it was it was his written and and drawn and uh, and then a couple of the things in the collections of like the the Batman 1000 or Detective 1000 and, and stuff like that, that he did some stories. But Captain Planet number one was the was my surprise Neil Adams in my collection. I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen. I assume it's not working. I can see it. OK, so you can see it. OK, I don't I mean, know. You if... see the Captain Planet. Oh, okay. I yeah, nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, OK, yeah. Like I've been, I've been trying to show. Like I pulled up the the Superman Ollie, and then I pulled up, you know, the Flash. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I've been trying to pull those up as you guys have been talking about. Yeah, that, I was searching on my own pages at the same time, <laughs> so I wasn't able to see yours. That's not a real Captain. good image of Captain Planet number one, just because it's kind of small and I blew it up. It gets a little grainy, but uh, right. okay. I just was curious if you actually were able to see those or not. So if I was wasting my time <laughs> trying. No, to no I enjoy it. Okay. All right. You're in full <laughs> producer mode. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, all right. So, uh, so my issue um, is uh, Batman issue 251, which I can't believe that both of you guys didn't pick this issue. Um, I'm trying to find my uh, my cheat sheet here, and this is obviously a pretty iconic cover. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, issue of the Joker kind of over the city of Gotham. He's holding up a, a playing card in front of him. And then you have Batman kind of on the playing card. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just the title, look out uh, Gotham, the Joker's back in town. So anytime you have Joker either holding the playing card or holding the fish, one of the two, it generally mm -hmm. makes for a pretty, uh, a pretty cool cover. Uh, so this is the one that stands out for me. And I think... I actually got to meet Neil Adams at Wizard World St. Louis several years ago, the first Wizard World. Um, and I think this is the issue that I had him sign. So I think I have this book uh, signed by Neil Adams. I have to double check that, you know, so like, you know, what book do I want to take to get signed? So this was the book that I chose. And even a couple of years ago, we saw it in previews catalog. There was a, a, a Joker T-shirt three quarter length that had this had this image on the front. So I even have a T-shirt that has this image uh, on the front of it as well. So um, speaking specifically of Neil Adams stories, there really aren't a whole lot because he, he didn't do an extended run on really any character. I mean, his probably his longest run, probably between Green Lantern and Batman. Um, you know, I, I, I would because even like the Green Lantern run didn't go. But what, 14, 15 issues, maybe because it started at 76. I mean, and. And what we got, John Stewart in 80, 87, I believe. 87. And then, you know, the junkie was what, 80? What'd you say it was, Shad? 85. 86 or 85? Okay. Yeah. So, and I don't know that he went much past John Stewart. So he yeah. didn't really have any extended runs on any particular book that I can look back. You know, it's just always for me, Neil Adams has been about the art. Um, just kind of as a, an interesting story uh, that the hotel that I was staying at whenever I uh, went to that wizard world, um, I get up for breakfast, you know, um, go down, go down and I'm eating and I'm just sitting here minding my own business and out comes Neil Adams to the buffet. Hmm. And he sits down like just a couple of tables away from me. So here I am being the total fanboy. I've got this old phone, you know, I'm like taking pictures, just trying, <laughs> hopefully he's not noticing me taking pictures and all that type of stuff. So that was kind of, he just sitting there eating his breakfast. You know, if I would, now I should obviously should have went and said something, but I'm sure he was probably tired of people walking up to him and just saying stuff. Mm -hmm. But then what was really interesting about that uh, moment was I'm getting up to leave. I'm going, I dump my tray in the trash and he basically comes right behind me is basically doing the exact same thing coming across the way from outside of the breakfast area is Stan Lee. So <laughs> Stan Lee and oh, man. Adams, they stop here in this area 
and they just chat with each other for just a couple of minutes. And here I am again. I got my phone out trying to <laughs> not obviously be taking pictures. So I had this really, really <laughs> crummy picture of uh, Neil Adams and Stan Lee talking to each other uh, here in the uh, in the hotel of uh, I can't remember what hotel it was, but they're in St. Louis for a Wizard World convention. So um, at the yeah, I get... go ahead. I'm just going to say that I, I, I was able to meet him, Tyler. Uh, our friend Tyler uh, and I were at C2E2 in 2018 or 17, 2017, and we were able to meet him. Um, it wasn't the, he wasn't in the best of moods that day is the best <laughs> I can say about it. And uh, yeah, I, I was like mentioning where we were from and giving him some context about Sparta printing. And he was like, where the hell is Sparta printing? And, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, it was cool to be able to meet him. Uh, I'm sure he gets a lot of bumbling idiot fans like me <laughs> that, that comes along. So I'm sure I, I can be forgiving of his shortness. But uh, and then later on that weekend, uh, we were staying at uh, the Blackstone. Ho no, no, we were staying at a, like a Hampton Inn, which but you had to catch the shuttle to the McCormick Center at the Blackstone Hotel, which was two or three blocks away. So we would go there and while waiting in the lobby. Here comes Neil Adams and I guess his wife. And, <laughs> you know, of course, me and Tyler like look like, you know, Abbott and Costello running into each other. Like, you know, <laughs> oh, my God, there is, you know, so. <laughs> and, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that it was Neil's. Uh, it, he wasn't just the great artist. He was also sort of a, uh, a groundbreaker in creator rights. Mm -hmm. um, he he's the one that really pushed for. He even tried to unionize uh, uh, creators, artists, writers, et cetera. That wasn't successful, but he was able to help Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, I think, mm -hmm. what he's most famous uh, uh, for in that regard. Um, so, you know, he's just, uh, like I said, he's a, a, a lifetime type artist. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it, you know, at age 80, you think, well, that's a long life. I, I wouldn't have put him at that age because it seemed no. like he was just 70 yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's true. So, but he seemed very very active and very in, uh, you know up until the end. He's yeah. he's been working pretty steadily. So it was a little bit of a shock. I got the impression that it was a little bit of a surprise. I mean, because it wasn't um, like a, a long term illness or anything. I mean, it was right. sepsis. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, so that usually was a result of something else. You know, so. Uh, so maybe you had a procedure or something, um, something that didn't just kind of went wrong or just, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, cause he was still doing, I mean, I can't, I, I'm, I would suspect if we, when we go through our next previews, there will probably be some Neil Adams covers that are being variants that have, that maybe been sure. in the can for like a few months, you know, that yeah. might still be in there. Cause uh, yeah, I was still seeing his name pop up in previews all the time. He did that series. I mean, as he aged, as his style changed, even whenever he left, the big two in the eighties, I think he went, maybe he founded, uh, was continuity, it continuity mm -hmm. and he had some books there Ms. and Mystic. the style. Yeah. The style even then was a little bit different. Um, and then he, they came back and he did a couple of mini series, uh, like a Batman mini mini series called mm -hmm. dark detective. I think, mm -hmm. um, his, he was obviously much better of a uh, artist than he was a writer, <laughs> but still it was worth, it's worth picking up those kinds of books just for the art. Yeah, yeah, he tried to do like a Kirby in his later career, like Kirby did, where he wanted to write yeah. and draw. And I, you know, you people have mixed feelings on Kirby as a writer and an artist, but I, I unfortunately, the consensus kind of is on Neil Adams' writing that it didn't, right, wasn't yeah. the greatest, which is why we focus in on his art, which is obviously sure, yeah. you know, what he excelled at. An another funny story about that Wizard World. Um, so Neil Adams is on the floor, and this guy I know from Paducah was also on the floor in Artist Alley. Now, he sold T-shirts. So he's standing there at his booth, and there's an aisle, and the table to his right is Neil Adams, and then directly to his left is Michael Golden. So I said, do you understand where you are? <laughs> and he said, yes, I realize. So, <laughs> Wow. Um, now, Michael Golden, I mean, he ranks up there, too, with Neil yeah. Adams. Now, you, I don't know if when he stopped drawing, but I, you know, he wasn't quite as prolific, I'd say, as Adams. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I, I don't know, speaking of prolific, 
uh, if you look on Mike's Amazing World of Comics, I think Neil Adams did like 800 covers, and about 650 of them were DC covers. Yeah. So he <laughs> did just a ton of covers. I'm just going to go and tell this story just because of the fact that it's it's actually from the TV show Comic Book Men. But you you Chad, you mentioned how they interviewed him for the podcast. But he's yeah. also showed up on an, an episode of Comic Book Men, and he was talking about the Superman 233 cover, which is the Kryptonite no more. So it's got Superman busting the Kryptonite chains, mm, mm-hmm. uh, and he's on the show and he's ta- he's talking about how much he hates that cover, <laughs> and everybody's like, "What are you talking about?" Um, and it's because to get the the wording at the bottom, they actually separated his legs further than what they're supposed to be. So they actually changed his art to get the kryptonite uh, no more to fit between his legs. And it just oh, apparently just really, really bothered him <laughs> to get the cover copy. And he, uh-huh. he had the kind of personality that he would be bothered yeah. by that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I brought up when I seen him at C2E2. You know that you know that uh, image of Batman where they would they took it and made it sort of a little icon to put it the, on the top of covers or in the corner where this cape is kind of billowing out and he's running really low and it's mm-hmm. and I brought it up I said man I just I just always love that image I even had like a sticker of it you know on my lunchbox or whatever <laughs> and he's, uh-oh I think your yeah I never got I think your hotel Wi-Fi is going bad. Oh, shoot. You might be caught up now. now. Yeah, it's better. Try uh, again. That turned into Mr. Roboto. Anyway, I don't <laughs> know what you heard there, but he he was very, he he uh, me talking about one of my favorite images that he's drawn, he says, yeah, I never got, I never got paid for that reproduction of that on all those covers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, oh. <laughs> sigh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, he was one of those creators. He's out there. He was in there at that time period where they just weren't. I mean, like there's a story of Jack Kirby taking grandkids into like the Toys R Us and seeing images that he did on the, you know, the art for for the card art yeah. for action figures and, and getting ill and having to actually leave, you know. Yeah. So I'm sure it's a, probably a similar situation with Neil Adams knowing how much money DC yeah. made off of his work that he didn't get any payment for, which is one of the reasons why he was such a big advocate for creator yeah. rights and and yeah. you know as much as important as his art is i think that's a much more important of a of you know something that he did you know long term was to help all the other comic creators you know get credit for the the work that they did so yeah i seem that, to remember that, that's a, his, go ahead sorry sorry as, as i see i seem to remember did he was he one of the first people to give to make sure that the artists got back their original artwork as well was uh, that something that he had had done i don't, I don't yeah. think he was part of that fight oh, okay um, that that's a good if you haven't read it already shed read the the marvel story by greg okay i know what you're talking about i haven't read it yet but oh. i know what you're talking about uh, what's his name the author's name uh greg low grid something like that it, it talks about that and that's a that's a fantastic book it's one of the books, mm-hmm. best books i've ever read but it talks about and i don't remember exactly who was involved in those whole you know returning original art but i believe it's in there Okay. So, all right. So there's our Neil Adams uh, recap. May he rest in peace and uh, uh, deservedly so. So uh, d- excellent career and uh, huge impact uh, on comics. I mean, was there anything, any last comments uh, before we, before we move on? Anybody wanted to, I don't want to cut that topic short. You know, I just. Uh, no, it's just, I, I, I kind of jumped around quite a bit just because I have so many tabs up to remind me what to talk about. I, <laughs> I almost, I did get, I did want to say that he, the one comic I brought along for him to sign when Ed C2E2 was the, I don't know if you ever seen him, Scott, but the, in the eighties, they did some reprints of the Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill run of green lantern, green arrow. It was the Baxter paper and Adams did all new covers for that, like a six issue reprint run, reprint run. They did the same thing for Dead Man as well, but I took the first issue of that and uh, got it signed. So uh, that's kind of that's one of my prized possessions. I did did bench. I forget to mention that when when I was at Wizard World, I did get a sketch by him of the Spectre. So I do have a sketch and an autograph from Neil Adams. So at least I do have that. So, (laughs) man. 
All right. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, Batman covers, uh, of course, the Batman was out earlier this year. I think we all have finally gotten around uh, to uh, watching uh, the Batman. So uh, unless somebody has something better, I'm going to go through this really, really brief recap. I got really brief recap of the movie, but a real quick rundown of the movie. And of course, spoilers, right, for anybody who's mm-hmm. listening, if you don't yep. want to you don't want to know what goes on in the movie because you haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Um, but basically, you know, the, the Riddler is the villain. He's just basically acting as a serial killer. He's leaving clues behind for Batman. And, and we learn through the movie that he's actually wanting Batman to kind of join his crusade against corruption in Gotham. So during this process, and this is early in the film, uh, he kills the mayor, who is actually in the middle of a mayoral election campaign. Uh, Gotham is, of course, a pretty crime ridden uh, city full of uh, gangs, including like a gang of Joker wannabes, right, who are trying to indoctrinate, um, you know, uh, somebody new into the gang. Uh, So there's a lot of a lot of crime, as we would expect, uh, going on in Gotham. So Batman, as he uh, is following the clues left by the Riddler, of course, it brings him into a little bit of a confrontation with the Penguin in his lounge. And I guess did they ever call it the Iceberg Lounge. They called it the Iceberg Lounge in the movie, didn't they? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, sure. I thought so. Yeah, it was the the front club and the back club was the was the Iceberg Lounge. But anyway, this is where he runs into Selena Kyle, who apparently he immediately becomes uh, infatuated with. I don't know any other way to describe <laughs> it besides that. But uh, their investigation leads to the involvement of the the of the Falcone family, and 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 I already forgot what the main Falcone's first name was. Um, uh, Carmine. Carmine, thank you. So, who we later learn is actually uh, Selena Kyle's father. So, more killings by the Riddler ultimately lead uh, the Batman and Selena to Falcone, where uh, Bruce learns. And actually, it's Bruce in his civilian identity learns that he actually killed someone at Thomas Wayne's and air quotes request. Right, which is which is important distinction here. Um, because of this whole renewal project, which was started by Thomas Wayne, whenever he was doing his initial, he was running for mayor previously, you know, back in, back in history, um, this renewal, uh, money was supposed to rebuild, uh, rebuild Gotham. Um, and Bruce Wayne actually is a target of the Riddler because he is of course the son of Thomas Wayne. So I guess that ridden the Riddler's mind that makes him guilty of the, of the father's sins, but it also leaves, Batman thinking that the Riddler actually knows his true identity. Uh, Falcone, along with the mayor, other officials that are in control of this renewal fund created by Thomas Wayne. Um, that's how they're able to finance everything that's going on. And of course, they're not doing anything to actually restore uh, Gotham. Ultimately, though, Falcone is captured, brought in. Um, and then as they are as they are leaving, the Riddler actually assassinates uh, Falcone. And uh, the Riddler kind of thinks it's all going according to his plan. Um, but during this uh, during this process, the Riddler actually gets captured. Uh, Batman confronts him. Of course, he does learn that the Riddler actually doesn't know his secret ID. So, you know, you see a big sigh of relief uh, coming from the Batman at this point. But he does learn that there's going to be bombs going off across the city, basically going to flood um, all of Gotham. So the gathering point for the city um, is the sports stadium, um, which is actually being hosted uh, the mayor's victory. Vic- Victory speech, acceptance speech, um, and during, you know, you have the flooding of the city, you have this, this is the gathering point for everybody in Gotham, so all the people are flooding to this, all the water is flooding to this location, there's already a lot of people there, uh, the Riddler has this gang of lackeys that basically attack, and this is where Batman, in a very public fashion, uh, helps uh, save the city, and then to kind of wrap things up, we have this post credit scene uh, in Arkham Asylum, where we have the Joker and the Riddler are actually speaking to each other. So really, really rough rundown of kind of the, some of the big events in the movie. What are some of the crucial things that I, that I left out in my real quick rundown there? I mean, I think the synopsis is, is, is really good. I, I I mean, my, my comments are more about just the overall, okay. Not what happened, but just the, the, the tone of the movie. All right. So you go, then go. Tell us about your thoughts on the tone of the movie. Um, okay, so it's more positive than negative, but it's not 100% positive. It's just I'm uh, I guess I'm at that point in my life where I need to go early in the day if it's going to take a whole <laughs> lot of thinking. <laughs> and although this movie was long, I don't think there was wasted footage. I just think that 
it needed you need it, it it requires your attention to get the most out of it and let me tell you my prime hours are like between 8 a.m and 11 a.m so uh <laughs> that's when i'll watch when i when i do the rewatch um it's not really so much a whereas you know the spider-man movies they're like your they're they're like you're the epitome of superhero movies. I love the Spider-Man movies. The Batman isn't a superhero movie. I mean, it's it's I mean, you got the gadgets and and the, and the trappings of one, but it's 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 more of a it's more of a sort of 70s crime drama drama than a blockbuster. And uh I I I I remember leaving the the theater with my wife and she really, she liked it, although she might have been saying it just to make to appease me but <laughs> like i'm not sure how i feel about it um but it's you know the in 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 hindsight if if and when well not if when i watch it again uh, i think i'll have a better appreciation for all of the new all of the nuance um that matt reeves was able to put into this movie um what i thought at first was annoying with pattinson as bruce wayne playing just as much a brooder as batman was it was more of like a, uh, he was like a hungover, you know, rock star, you know, um, and he's just so. But at the same time, I, 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 he didn't because it was early in his career and he didn't really have this alter ego, which everybody, you know, for a long time, there's been the um, assertion that Bruce Wayne is the alter ego and Batman is the real person. Um, so for him to put on, it took some years for, for Bruce Wayne to really get down that, that, uh, playboy persona down pat. Um, John Turturro as Carmine Falcone was fantastic and Colin Farrell. Um, <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't even know it was Colin Farrell, uh, playing the penguin, uh, the, the Riddler himself, uh, I didn't, I don't know what I've seen him in, um, but I didn't at the time, but I did look up the information and he did work or did play in um, There Will Be Blood that mm -hmm. um, it's that uh, oil, the one with uh, Daniel, Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis. So that was intense too. Yeah. Um, so uh, then lastly, I just want to say that um it's the best batmobile yet it's a muscle car <laughs> it's not some high-tech rumbler um it's 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 just uh the, the guy that you know in sh somewhat short notice um deciding he's going to be um the instrument of vengeance that he wants to be he just muscles up uh, uh a car and uses his uh and uses it in some of the one of the best um best chase or you know uh chase sequences i've seen that's it. That's it. All right. Chad, go ahead. Well, I, I felt like this is the first Batman movie that we actually got some real internal monologue. Uh, and I was all there for that. That was, you know, I think that's what we opened up after after the, the opening Riddler kind of murder scene. That's what we got was like some internal monologue, some journaling, some uh, of him kind of recapping. And I felt like that was that was one of the big charms of this movie was the detective part of it was him talking about things him having the eye cameras that, <laughs> uh, and then reviewing the footage afterwards. And, and some of the dialogue I felt was a little rough because it was a detective story. So it's like repeating the things that you visually see, but it felt like it grounded that, uh, kind of, uh, detective work. You have to say, well, this is what's going on or that you kind of guide people along because you're, using deductive reasoning and if they didn't kind of spell things out then it wouldn't maybe seem real as a detective story i guess it's, it's like we got word balloons in a movie yes you know yeah it's, it, yeah it, and that was that was really cool i like that uh, yes <laughs> uh a couple of things that i noted that i didn't grab on the first time but the second time through was that he does mark in his journal that it is october of year two of being the batman uh, which I didn't grab right away in the theater, but it, for some reason it took a smaller screen for me to see these <laughs> these details. Um, and then they mentioned specifically that it's 20 years ago was the murder, which puts him, I don't know in this Bruce how old he is 
when his parents get murdered, but it's usually anytime between said seven to be, and he's 10. like five to seven. Yeah. Okay. Is yeah. So so he's in that he's twenty in, in his late twenties in his mid to late twenties, mm-hmm. um, and I, I at first it real off putting that he was angsty like he he felt like an angsty teenager, uh, and then I got to thinking about it and I was like, well, one thing is he is he is a rich kid he is mm-hmm. somebody who's gotten whatever so the the kind of the arrogance that he had especially talking with Alfred yeah uh, made made a little bit more sense in that lens though you don't want your hero to act like that I guess uh, and then second of all I felt like he could just be cranky and a little emo because this is year two and he's exhausted and like you had said like he he hasn't really figured out his Bruce Wayne persona yet so he's just mm-hmm. He's up at all hours. He's reviewing tape as soon as he gets back. So he's just reliving the entire night and he's just beat. And so he's kind of crabby because of that. And <laughs> kind of, I put that through that perspective. I was like, oh, okay, well that maybe that makes a little bit more sense in there. Um, you know, the, the, the score I thought was awesome. Oh, the, dun, the, dun, dun, dun. Yes. I uh, get stuck in your head. <laughs> Michael Gia, Giacchino, I think is how you say his last name. Uh, feel you know it feels very Elfman influenced at times, but then it mm-hmm. goes beyond that to this like spy thriller, and it has it just has all these elements to that. Uh, and the Batman theme, yes, was it was awesome. Uh, to that, I just I was really digging the sound of it throughout. Yeah. Um, let's see. Going I, I don't I, I don't feel like it was Elfman because Elfman is more. There was some whimsical bubbly. Elfman-y. Bubbly. <laughs> you know? I, I don't know. I, mean, I think back to like the Batman 89 soundtrack or I have Boingo, to... Boingo or, you know, I don't, I don't play that music to, to the Batman, you know. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to cue up some exact times, but there were some yeah. that I felt were very, like he was pulling from the, maybe the original Batman movie or Batman mm-hmm. Returns like maybe Batman score. Returns. I can I can yeah. see that more in Batman Returns now. I'm trying to think of you know, because like I that's like I actually bought those soundtracks and yeah, right. <laughs> I think I think uh now that you say that maybe Batman Returns. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll concede the point. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um you know that there was really only a couple of missteps I thought. One being the just helmet cam shot when he jumps off the building and he's flying squirrel and he's got the the dumb shot from there that was just the <laughs> yeah. worst shot in the entire movie uh i don't know yeah, why that was okay there. so can i comment on that absolutely that, that, that's when i thought why if spider-man can we can film him with cgi shooting <laughs> webs and swinging for, through the streets of new york so fantastically it's so much fun to watch spider-man do that yeah why can't we see batman do that with his right. grappling hook i appreciate the lack of cgi in this movie yeah. that's true that's Absolutely. true but overall with batman movies you rarely i think the most you got to see of that was maybe a couple of scenes in the justice batman v superman yeah or maybe it was the justice league the dawn of justice one of where you know we got the whether it was, uh, I forget if it was the, the, the Parademon or if it was uh, Doomsday or whatever, where he's right. trying to avoid the blows and he's choo, choo, swinging back and forth. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it shows that he's human and he's relying on technology. Yeah. Um, but we don't get to see that visually much. But I agree with you, too, on that, Scott, that it's it was nice not having really any CGI. Yeah. I did in that scene, though, I loved that he did crash. Like he didn't nail that landing <laughs> like, no. and, you, and you go, Oh yeah, he's still, he's still two years into this thing. Like he's not going to be perfect at it. He's going to have a crash landing and just bite it sometimes. <laughs> it, it reminds me, and I know I'm dating myself, but it reminds me of the greatest American hero TV show where <laughs> he's, he's flies, but he does it and he crashes every time. <laughs> yeah. It was from the eighties. Yeah. But yeah. William, William Cat. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I liked Zoe Kravitz as a, as a cat woman. I thought she was mysterious. Mm-hmm. I thought that she put on that persona. Well, definitely better than Anne Hathaway was as a, as a cat woman. Um, in my opinion, um, I, I didn't, at first I thought penguin was a pretty unnecessary, uh, part to the story period. Like we could have seen that entire movie done without the penguin and mm-hmm. it would have been fine. Um, but you know, as, as the second second roll through um i thought he he was a little bit better and I, I i could see where it was a necessary 
to have a role that was kind of the you wanted to focus on the penguin being the bad guy. He was the deflection of maybe mm-hmm. he was the the one that we were trying to chase through the riddles riddles. Uh, the Riddler's riddles. <laughs> we also need somebody that's a little bit of, you know, groundwork done for a future Batman. Exactly. And of course, we're, we're going to get the Penguin TV series as well. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, 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 I, and I liked the I liked the character, the villain. We'll just call it the villain. I didn't he didn't need to be the Riddler. Yeah. It, it didn't. It could have been no. this all new character. It could have been some version of Hush. It could have been <laughs> anything uh, any of the any of Batman's smarter rogues gallery could have been this role um, because the riddles weren't that creative. Um, <laughs> no. So but I, but I liked Paul Dano uh, is just this weird, wild character actor from time to time where he just like the noises and the screams and like just he's just a weird dude. He looks weird. It's awesome. In that, like, you go, that guy could be a serial killer. Absolutely. <laughs> no doubt about it. Uh, but I, you know, one of my favorite parts was was him with with Batman in Arkham Asylum going through where you, the music is getting really intense and you feel like it's going to be revealed that maybe he actually knows who Bruce Wayne is. And he's just building up. And then he, it find, he finds out, he's like, I thought you were with me this entire time. I thought <laughs> you were going to help me. And... And then he just lets out that like scream of like, this is not the way it was going to happen. And like that whole scene was probably the best and should have been the ending to this movie um, <laughs> at, at a, at a perfect like two hour and 10 minute. When that scene's mm-hmm. over, we did not need the last 35 minutes uh, <laughs> of anything. It was, it's a really good movie up until that point. The true ending as I have in my notes uh, to the, <laughs> to that movie. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really liked it. I like that we are setting up some characters to go forward with. I personally think that he injected himself with Venom at the end of the movie, uh, which opens us up to the Venom storyline. It mm-hmm. opens us up to Bane. It opens mm-hmm. us up, up to Bruce dealing with addiction issues, potentially in a Batman 2. Um, and uh, I, I don't really care about the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have seen it twice. The first time I agree that it was, I thought it was too long. However, the second time that I watched it, I, it didn't, the length of the movie didn't bother me at all the second time, I guess, because I knew it was a little bit longer, yeah. a little bit slower grind. Um, and I, maybe grind's not the, not the right word for that. <laughs> um, but uh, I, of course, also the first time that I saw it, I was getting over an upper respiratory infection. And on the second on the second viewing, I am not convinced that I maybe didn't fall asleep a couple of minutes <laughs> in the first movie because well here's the reason why we get to the end of that movie where the Riddler's goons are attacking mm-hmm. the stadium, and I thought I was sitting there thinking that came out of nowhere. There is no setup for that in the entire movie, and it's like why. Did they just randomly all decide that they're going to attack this? Oh, and they're coordinated. Well, the second time I watched it, that scene is there. They're setting up. They're arming themselves. They're doing all that. <laughs> and I, uh, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, know if I missed just that part. <laughs> missed it or if I fell asleep. So, um, and maybe that's why I didn't think of highly at the, after the first, I posted out of the first movie too long, should have been about 30, 45 minutes shorter. The acting's great. Not written for us, written for the Oscars. You know that that was that was my entire review of it. But on the second viewing, uh, my opinion of it changed dramatically. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> you you talked about the ending maybe not being necessary. Well, I think they should have cut, and this is going to be sacrilegious to a lot of people. Was all of the Alfred scenes were completely oh, yeah. worthless. They yeah. did not add anything to the movie at all. Agreed. Um, so, and which is, uh, which is a shame that Andy Serkis was so underused, you know, in yeah. that. Um, so if you're not going to use Alfred, then cut Alfred, you know, um, you know, he can let, he can, Bruce can let Alfred in on his secret in the second movie and there can be all the ramifications yeah. there. But, but I, I just, I just, you know, I just felt like that was kind of um, unnecessary. What I did like the suit design. What did, mm-hmm, what did the mm-hmm. two of you think of the suit design? It looked like uh, it wasn't as rough as, say, uh, you know, the first Spider-Man suit that that 
that Peter Parker puts together. But you could tell, I mean, with the stitching around the nose, um, you could tell there was some homemade uh, aspects or at least non. It's not like he had his prof- a professional tailor that was he was in cahoots with uh, to be his you know personal designers. But I'm sure Alfred did all of that. Uh, but the the yeah the overall whether the, the he uh, I like the collar I like mm-hmm. that he can turn his neck and not be you know have to turn <laughs> yeah. shoulders and all yeah. Uh, yeah like most of the previous uh, Batman Batman mm-hmm. actors um, so yeah I I did like it and I liked even though it looked a little corny I liked the fact that okay uh, let's 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 figure out how to make a flying squirrel uh, <laughs> yeah. design out of this. And I'm guessing that you know it's it's not addressed in there, but it's I think it's just for people to pay attention to is it is the gun is is what is melted down as his bat symbol on yeah, the chest. Yeah, yeah, and that I think that came. I haven't researched this, but when I watched it, I, I the first thing I thought of was a short story in Detective Comics 1000 mm-hmm. written by Kevin Smith. Um, who? Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, where, yeah. So did, did, is that true that that idea or that came from that or is it, that's the first time that I saw uh, that yeah. as a story point was from that detective okay. 1000. Same. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, now the thing about the suit though, is every, he would be in suit and the next thing he'd be riding his motorcycle with his helmet on wearing this little teeny tiny backpack. And I'm like, where did the suit go? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, that was that was kind of a little that was kind of a little weird. But, uh, but you know, uh, the Flash keeps his suit and is compressed inside yeah, the ring. That's you know that's a different that's a little different. Uh, different setup. <laughs> but actually, all of the all of the acting in this, Pattinson was great. And Zoe. Zoe Kravitz was great. They were all uh, they were all terrific. Andy Circus in the John scenes Turtle. that he had, he was, he was good. Everybody, just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Anything he does. Yeah. The cast was just just incredible um i still the, know the that, it was on the trailer too but the, i remember the the uh colin farrell making the penguin be so excited that he got away and then he didn't get away he's uh, like <laughs> i got him i got away and then oh, you're coming yeah. crashing through <laughs> yeah <laughs> i still though even after the second watch think that that was written to win oscars it wasn't written to make money. It wasn't written to for fan service. It was, it was written for the Oscars. That seems to be the just juxtaposition of these DC movies mm-hmm. that aren't part of the original two or three. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the Snyderverse. That mm-hmm. seems to be the path that they sort of are going, you know, with the Joker and now the Batman. Uh, you know, and I know Shazam was its own thing. Um, it was lighthearted, but it obviously wasn't for the fan. It wasn't fan service or it wasn't uh, for the Oscars. Um, but I see a little, I'll see a little, I think we'll see a little bit more of that in the future where they, they just let directors do like an Elseworlds version of, mm-hmm. of, uh, the, the character. Did you, did you watch the extended cut of the, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the extended deleted cut? of the Joker and Batman's interaction in prison. I did not. Yeah, I, I you have to. You okay. almost have to. It, it it makes that I didn't really care too much for what was in the movie. Um but the, the what came out I don't know not too long after that that was released, yeah. mm-hmm. but it it showed this uh Keegan that was I think I believe he played in the Eternals, didn't he? He yeah. did. He did. Yeah. Um it showed a type of Joker that was part Heath Ledger um, and maybe part um, Joaquin this, Phoenix. Yeah, I think so. That's uh, yeah. Uh, he's definitely more scarred. I mean, it's grotesquely uh, it's, it's just the facial scars are really mm-hmm. crazy, but what it also reminded me of the Scott Snyder new 52 Joker um, yeah. just because it was so horror oriented which I wasn't a big fan of that, but at first I wasn't really a, a big fan of this Joker, but now I'm kind of interested to see this version <laughs> pop up. Maybe not much of him, um, but maybe, you know, just speckled in here and there. Maybe we can get a, uh, a silence of the lambs, uh, you know, prison scene and not much yeah. more than that, you know? <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> All right. Well, what'd you, uh, Mike, what'd you grade this movie at? 
Uh, um, well, I'm going to give it a. It. I'm going to give it a very fine. Eight five. All right, Shad. What yeah. about you? Um, I would agree with that. I'd go eight five. Very fine. <laughs> well, when I after I walked out of the show the first time, if I had to have graded right then, I would have given it a six. Fine. After the second viewing, I'm exactly where you guys are. Eight five. <laughs> I'm eight wow. five. We so I guess I'm a little higher. We very we all fine agree. Amen. I'm an eight. I'm an eight five on this one. I don't know what it is. You know, I like. I still, I still don't know why I didn't <laughs> like it when I left the first time, and I, yeah. I'm convincing myself it's because I was tired. You know, so yeah, I'm, that, blaming, that I'm blaming the upper respiratory infection for the reason why <laughs> I didn't just love it the first time, and the fact that maybe I fell asleep for two minutes. So, so Batman's worst that. enemy is not the Joker, but. Of a respiratory respiratory infection. Infection. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Flim. Flim man. <laughs> All right. So definitely watch it if you haven't seen it. And of course, I guess they need to watch that extended scene. Mm-hmm. All right. Time for CLZ shake. So get out your phone. Shake it up. Shake it up. Shake, shake, yeah. shake. Uh, All right. So who wants to go first? Put I'll shirt. do it. All right. Go. What's that say? I can't tell. Lady Mechanica, Tablet of Destinies, <laughs> issue six. Uh, I don't remember what happens in this specifically, but it's the grand finale of the Tablet of Destinies. Uh, Lady Mechanica is pretty cool. Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, that for a long time. Uh, Joe Benitez uh, was was writing and drawing originally. This is not written by him. Uh, written by M.M. M. Chin. And uh, this is probably towards the end of the run that I had, I had read because I read all of the series up until he kind of stopped producing it himself. And I haven't read anything since Image. But uh, artwork was always cool. The stories were very wordy. Um, and uh, so it was a little bit of art with a lot of words around it. But I, I was a big fan of Lady Mechanica. I never read a single issue of that series. I haven't, and it's it's something I am a bit regretful about. Yeah, but yeah, the first couple of stories are good. The first couple of runs because they're all like, you know, they're they're not it's not ongoing in a way. It's all a bunch of minis, whether it's six issue series mm-hmm. to solve the problem, or three or two or four or whatever. They all kind of run in spurts. I maybe actually read the free comic book day version of, of one oh, of those yeah. stories, like the first issue or something like that. Mm-hmm. She has like, I mean, like her, all of her body parts are not, she's not human, right? No, she's very humanoid. Okay. Like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a vague recollection of that story. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what you got? Uh, oh, it's a key <laughs> issue. How about that? Hey, I have the Batman volume three, number 92. Scott, who who's oh, experience? That would be punchline. That's right. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the plot is the uh, the greatest heist in history is underway in Gotham City, courtesy of the mysterious crime master known as the Designer. Madman knows what he needs to do, but in order to stop the plot, he must first escape the most ingenious death trap the Riddler has Riddler has ever devised. Writer James Tynan, artist Guillaume March, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, 92 is not uh, her first appearance. That's what it's. I mean, that's what CLZ tells me. It's uh, first. Oh, no, no, no. First cover appearance. First cover appearance. Yeah, because her first appearance is in. Her first cameo is in 89. And then her first appearance is in uh, Hello Risen 3. Yeah. I swear. That's okay. It used to be. It used to be first appearances. Now it's first cover appearance. (laughs) First cameo. (laughs) First full appearance. Uh yeah, but anyway, first cover appearance is what that um what that was. So yeah, I had not fine. read any of the James Tynion run. I actually just started reading that, and Punchline is one of the least interesting characters. It is I have ever read. She is just so <laughs> yeah. The designer not, is more interesting than her. The design mm-hmm. in that in that run. Yeah, the things I've seen so far are just not have not been good. I'm because yeah. I'm only like ninety mid nineties, you know, in mm-hmm. that run. I stopped at Tom King and I've been buying them. I just hadn't read them. So, yeah. All right, here we go. So I can get all the reflection off of that. 
Oh, Rom. Big Surprise. <laughs> Rom. Okay. That's two times uh, in a row. Didn't you have Rom last time? I, probably. But this is the <laughs> IDW uh, version of Rom. So since I am a glutton for punishment, I did also buy all of the IDW run of Rom. Um, I did uh, read this. It is not good. I would not really. It's okay. I would not recommend it uh, to anybody. Well, you know, again, it's not my ROM. Mine's the Marvel ROM. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was just hopeful that we would, uh, that we would, you know, bring something new to the character. And, yeah, it just, it just didn't grab me. But I do still have it. So, uh, there you go. It's in my, it's in my collection. So, and it's, uh, <laughs> let's see. It's, uh, no, it's just, it's actually the subscription cover. Because I was like, for a while, I was buying all the covers, too. And I finally mm. thinned those out. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right well there you have another uh, episode shad what do we got next next we have a tribute to george perez as well as a uh a, a small dive not a deep dive on the she hulk she hulk trailer and then uh moon knight season one all right all right mike if they wanted to track you down where would they do that at they would get on their uh favorite email uh <laughs> <laughs> email client email of their service. choice yes <laughs> and type m dot atchison nine zero at gmail.com all right shad uh you can find me on facebook and then that is at shad schubert s-h-a-a-d-s-c-h-u-b-e-r-t and you can find me at berg comics.com b-u-r-g comics i'll be at uh, my next show is uh june 10th and 11th in metropolis illinois at the metropolis supercon being held during the superman uh celebration and then of course on uh saturday july 23rd i think that's right the muddy monster uh comic con with a couple of power rangers so we're not into power <laughs> rangers so but we'll just say there will be power rangers there. that's right to get their autographs so there you have it all right so we'll be back uh soon with another episode this leapfrog looks like more like a he's got red eyes he looks angry and frogman looks to have like eyeballs coming out of the mouth which is what we see on the in the trailer he's listed as a well-meaning frogman's a well-meaning but often bungling superhero mm -hmm. and the son of the villain leapfrog oh ah. okay there's also a frogman who is a member of the annie man from back in mm -hmm. daredevil okay let me uh. see if i can i think it's gonna be leapfrog because again he was the sillier of the two. Any man, the any man, was supposed to be serious. So you just, you're you're thinking this whole thing is going to be a silly show. Yeah, <laughs> and I know Scott loves silly. Oh uh, yeah. Okay, so there's Frogman.